Good morning. Uh, this talk is about the agile transformation that we have been doing at eBay Enterprise Barcelona. So it's a real story. It is still going on. And I hope that at the end of this presentation, you've got something to take away and something that you want to try in your, in your environment. My name is Fabio Frascella. I have been a Scrum Master at eBay Enterprise Barcelona during the last 12 months, more or less. And before that, I used to be a QA engineer. eBay Enterprise is, a, is an e-commerce uh, partner for large retailers and brands. And here in Barcelona, we build a product that uh, allows them to run their business. So the office is about uh, 90 people, more or less. And the developers are about 25, more or less. So the story starts um, 12 months ago. And the way we, were, we used to work was something like this. Um, our product development was mainly driven by clients' requests, so uh, in the form of projects. So we used to receive long lists of requirements. And there's Santa Claus there who reads the requirements. We used to develop these things, and in the end, hopefully, the client was satisfied and was going to sign off. The, our teams were built around the layers of the application. So there was a front-end team, a back-end team, and a separate QA team. These teams were pretty much departments, and they used to have managers, command and control, and so on. Projects were wonderful. And uh, the way I remember the technical practice is something like this. I used to call that uh, the cowboy style because we didn't used to have a uh, community of practice. We didn't used to share best practices and so on. And the way I remember testing is like this. It was uh, manual. It was inefficient, slow, and in the end, it was painful. So then management started to look for ways to do things different. If it sounds familiar, that is us 12 months ago. We started to look into ways to, uh, to do things differently, so Scrum, Kanban, and so on. So our management reached out to some Agile experts in the market, and they came in the office, and they helped us to, to start, to kick off. So the story I'm going to tell is about what we did since they started with us, and a lot of experiment that worked some others that didn't work so well, and the things that we've learned. So the first thing I want to share with you is how we built our, our first Scrum teams and how the setup has evolved during this year. So back 12 months ago, we had to deal with two things. We wanted to build long-term view for our product because we used to have a product driven by just client requests. But at the same time, we had a lot of client requests in our pipeline, and we had committed to those. So what we said is, let's do, with our development department, let's do two Scrum teams, like uh, product teams, and two services teams. So product teams were supposed to work on building the core product, and services teams were supposed to deliver customizations to our clients. And so we did this setup. The upper part is a service team that was using that used to work with our oldest product and oldest client, and they were basically doing maintenance. So in the end, they decided to be a Kanban uh, to use Kanban. But the lower part is the interesting one. Uh, this is where we spent most of the effort in changing and applying, trying to apply Scrum. And uh, we have these product teams working on core and service teams dealing with the client. And what we, find out, what we found out after a couple of months working like this is that this wasn't working for us. And we had a clear bottleneck here. The service team was waiting for features from the product teams. Features sometimes were late, redesigns were unexpected, and so they started bitching one another. And then we said, OK, uh, let's change it. Let's try something different. So we said, um, Let's try this setup. But at the same time, we had to build a completely new component for this product because our next client was needing something different. 
And so we got in front of this dilemma, should we use feature teams to solve this because we wanted to avoid these dependencies or should we use component team to build a new component? And in the end, we ended up with something like this. Our second experiment was feature teams plus component team. And I use a question mark uh, next to feature teams because when we started talking about feature teams in our, in our office, it soon became a trending topic. And most people were asking, what the hell is feature teams? How does it look like? People started to be really confused and they basically uh, didn't know how to do feature teams. So, well, we started with this new setup with a component team building the new component and three feature teams that were feature teams. They were supposed to be able to deliver any feature to this client. And we had a lot of issues with the setup. One was, again, dependency on the component team. So these guys were not uh, really able to work on any feature. They had to wait for the component to be ready. The second issue we had was ownership. We sometimes didn't know who was going to do what, who should fix this, and so on. And finally, we had a lot of issues with project management because project management life with this setup was a nightmare. Uh, they didn't know who to ask the things. Uh, questions were, uh, there was a lot of duplication of tasks, tasks and so on. So for this project, for this client, it was painful. We had a massive retrospective and we said, okay, we can solve a lot of problems by solving this setup. But this time we wanted to do th things differently, so we said, let's change the setup, but not just change the setup. Let's change the setup and ask our teams to do it. So we decided to facilitate an event where all these people could choose where to go and form new teams. And what we said is, guys, out of, three, or out of these three, sorry, these four teams, we need to make three teams, but we want three real feature teams. So those new teams have to be able to work on any component that is here, and they also have to be able to deliver any feature to that client. We told them that they should do it in a couple of hours. We facilitated a nice event with a little bit of gamification. We had actually, we had a Christmas tree representing, we, we had four Christmas trees, and each Christmas tree was representing a team and decorations of the Christmas tree were the skills that they had to bring into the team. So at the end, we wanted four complete Christmas trees. So basically, we hosted this event, and in the end, they did it. They reshaped, they shuffled around, and they did this. Our third experiment is feature teams. So, or at least our interpretation of the feature teams. So this is the setup we have now. It's three feature teams coming from those four. And they're supposed to be able to work on any component in the product and deliver any feature to this client. So the question is, will this setup resolve all the problems? We don't know, because it's new and it's only a few weeks since we started like this. But we know that that activity that where we shaped the teams was a real success in terms of uh, facilitating for a big group and making things fast and, and decision process were really, was really smooth and fast. So we went from those um, departments to uh, scrum teams, which are uh, self-organized and cross-functional, and we also introduced a new concept, which is the tribe. In our office, a tribe is uh, basically a community of practice. We have three tribes, and the most, the most active one is the development one, but we also have the QA tribe and the operations tribe. So tribe is to build knowledge, to share best practices, and to uh, drive continuous improvement. And tribes come with tribe leaders. Tribe leaders, uh, they used to be managers in the old setup, but the tribe leader in our office is not a people manager. He's not supposed to do uh, to approve holidays or things like that. Tribe leader is a guy who's supposed to drive continuous improvement, to host those initiatives that allow people to learn and to improve in their craft. 
And when we started talking about tribe leaders, some managers uh, started to look a bit confused. They started to be confused, but they also started to ask the tough questions. And questions like, who's going to do appraisals now? Who's going to do promotions inside the teams? Who's going to approve expenses? Who's going to do uh, the team buildings? Who's going to do the trainings? And so on. A long list of questions. And what we tried to do with this change was to, wherever possible, to bring these tasks that, were, that used to belong to managers inside the teams. So a few things that worked really well this year, for instance, uh, we have a, a number of them, but one that worked really well is team buildings. So the Scrum teams this year had to manage their own budget for team building. And it was up to them. They could spend the budget to go out for dinner 10 times in a row, or they could use the, uh, they could use the budget to have a nice uh, golf day outside Barcelona. Holidays, uh, for instance, is no longer approved by manager. The Scrum teams have their, they have to guarantee some availability, but they choose how to spend their holidays. They don't need approvals. And um, we are working on something new now, still ongoing. We want to uh, allow or give a method or something to the teams where they can decide who's going to run for a promotion. So they decide. So th this expression is not just the managers. No, it's not just how they reacted. It's also a lot of the developers reacting like this. Because they, a lot of people were was, was, uh, used to work with manager. And wherever possible, we try to improve uh, or we try to convince them that it's also them who can make decisions and make pro proposals. So they, they can really make things change. I haven't talked about the Scrum Masters yet, and uh, in our office we are three Scrum Masters. We started like two Scrum Masters, then eventually we grew and now we are three. And the role of the Scrum Master in our office is a full-time role. That means that we don't do any project management, nor developing, nor testing. We just do Scrum Masters. But at the same time we do Scrum Master for more than one team, so it could be two or three teams at the same time. And this model has worked really well for us because it allows us to um, learn a lot from different teams because teams are all different. And it also allows us to focus 100% on making interactions between people better because we don't have to focus on the product, so we can just do that. And the sum of us, of the Scrum Masters plus our head of technology, is what we call the Kaizen team. Uh, the Kaizen team in our office is supposed to help the, team, the Scrum teams, but it's also supposed to, do, uh, to bring agile um, uh, mindset to the rest of the companies, of the company, sorry. So we are something like that. We are there in the middle of the teams, but also of the company. And it's key that we have management with us. That really helps us, helps us to... Uh, drive real change. So management is key uh, with us. When we started, people used to call us the guy with the post-its, and because we started uh, using a lot of information radiators, and post-its is, of course, one of them. Actually, when we started, we completely changed the look of our oldest office. We, we started removing all the information from the walls, so it was a good cleanup as well. And then we, 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 use it, we started using big TV screens to show KPIs or information like failing tests, failing builds, and so on. This, uh, this looked really cool, but for me, the information radiator that works best in our office is this one. There, there is a nice anecdote behind this kitten. It's funny that we had a kitten this morning in the same room, but... This is another kitten, but this kitten here, uh, the anecdote is when we started with these um, monitors, with these TV screens with green and red builds, we didn't have the effect we wanted to. We noticed that developers were not just paying enough attention to them. Sometimes they went home and things were in red, and we said, why do we need to have a, a TV showing red when we're not doing anything with it? So it was not really working well as an information radiator. 
And then we started making this joke with the teams that any time, every time they went home and there was something in red, a little kitten was dying. And then we started actually showing those little kittens on the TV screens. Whenever there was something in red on the screen, the kitten appears. And it's funny because that really is catching the people's attention. Not, not the, the, the red thing, but that is, is doing it well. So eventually this became what we were looking for. This, this is a real information radiator. And when developers see it now, they say, oh, something is broken, and they start looking for the error. So experiment that worked. Another thing that we tried in our first setup was to um, resolve one thing that we used to have historically, and that was the collaboration issues between the teams, the development teams, and operations. We used to have lack of trust and hard time when they tried to cooperate. And then we tried something a bit extreme, and we said, why don't we bring those IT operations skill inside the teams? So we said, IT operations guy, would you please split and go inside the teams? They started to look a bit <laughs> confused. And we tried this experiment during a few months. And what we were looking for was better cooperation between them, sorry, collaboration between them, and hopefully to build some trust between them. Eventually, this experiment failed. It was a complete, complete failure. Um, we didn't, uh, we didn't uh, obtain or we didn't have that trust that we were looking for, and collaboration didn't improve. And there are a number of reasons behind this, but main two reasons that we had at that time are that operations team was small and they had a lot of tasks that didn't really belong to product development. So when they were with the teams, they were not collaborating too much and they were not adding so much value. So our, so the, the backlogs actually started to look messy because the things that they were doing had nothing to do. And the second reason is because at that time, as an organization and the Scrum teams and Scrum practitioners, were, we were not ready yet. We were really not mature yet. So eventually we rolled back that experiment and IT operations went back and they are now a separate team. When we started with our agile transformation, our meetings grew exponentially in numbers and in length. And we've been trying to do something to address this. Um, to address number of meetings, one thing that worked really well for us is to try and make some of them on demand. And there's an example. We used to have a meeting called Daily Sync. And that's, that's happening after all the daily stand-ups. And basically, that's one or at least one person per each team gathering together and talking about dependencies and things that they want to take into account for that day. So this meeting used to happen every morning, but eventually it lost its momentum because people either was showing, but there was not, no one else, or they wanted to talk about something, but the people they needed was not there, and so on. So eventually it was losing momentum, and we say, let's try to make it happen on demand. And what we did was we brought one of those bells that you find in a hotel reception, and we put it there where they used to meet. So now when someone needs something in that moment when we used to have this, this meeting, this person can go there and ring the bell. And, and people will go there because they know that that's the signal that we need this meeting. Otherwise, the meeting doesn't take place. So with this, we reduce a lot the number of these meetings. And when we do it now, it's because we need, because there is something to talk about. And another way which one particular team is trying to reduce their meetings is they decided to have core hours. So this team was suffering because in some, some core hours they had to attend meetings and they could not work together as a team. And so they said, let's book those hours to be together. It's just us working on our things. And they physically did it. They went to Outlook and now they are all booked. If you try to have one of them in those hours, they are busy, and they will eventually will reject the meeting. So they, they reduce the number of meetings, and they also 
can work together for longer time in a row. We also try to address not just the number of meetings, but also the, the make them more, more efficient. And that's all about facilitation. Well, when I started one year ago, I had absolutely no idea of facilitation. I started to read about it. I started to work with my colleagues and learned about it. And eventually, we started to facilitate uh, retrospectives, meetings, and so on. When we did our last Teams Reshape, we did a lot of facilitation for a, a large number of people, and it worked really well. And another example of decision that involved a lot of people that we facilitated is after that reshaping, we wanted the teams to choose their new seats. Now, if you have done this before, you know it can be really painful because either you select the place for everyone and they start complaining, or you try to, to bring them into decision making and that's starting to be endless. We tried something different. We tried to actually make them decide, but in a fast way. And what we did, we did is uh, we basically called one of them per team. We showed them a map of the office, so desks where they were going to spread. And we gave them uh, little post-its, uh, broken and made little balls. So each team had their little balls with their color. And then we said, guys, this is the layout. Now you decide. And they have 20 minutes to do that. And that eventually worked really well. Uh, it was a huge number of decisions to be made in a very short time. And they did it. They finally used to put those balls where they were going to see it, discuss, and really fast, really efficient. One of the things that, as Kaizen team, we also do for the rest of the company is something that we call the feedback experiment, also known as the Candice experiment. What that is, uh, it comes from a problem that we had at the beginning that we wanted to solve. We wanted to find a way for the Scrum teams to do their appraisal without a manager. And the way we were imagining that solution was a bag of candies. So we were imagining a team having to share between them a bag of candies. And they could decide to spread them equally or they could decide to give more candies with the guys with better feedback, and they would give feedback one another. But then we said, this sounds really cool, why don't we bring it to the whole company? And we also said, why don't we do it, not just that I give candies to you, but why don't we do that this whole team gives candies to this whole other team? And then we did it. We've had five editions this year of this exercise, and it looks like this. Each team gets feedback from all the other teams in the company, not just Scrum teams. I mean, every team in the company, it's finance, it's sales. And they give feedback and candies. And in the end, this team gets candies as the sum of all the candies that these guys give. And we do all the combinations. So each team receives and, gets, uh, receives and gives candies. When we started this exercise, a lot of teams looked like this. How can we give feedback to those, guy, to those guys? We don't know them, we don't work with them, we don't know anything about them. And so they used to give blank feedback a lot of times. But then we started with edition two and edition three, and eventually the teams started to do something with their feedback. They, for instance, the teams that had feedback like, we don't know what you do, we don't know what you do, they started to present themselves to the rest of the company. They started to show what they do and why they bring value to the company. And also teams that got not so good feedback, they started to do something with it. So we had, for instance, financial updates every quarter, and those presentations didn't look really clear to the rest of people. That came out in this feedback, and now presentations are completely different. They look much more clear, and people understand them. And that's thanks to this exercise. So feedback is a means to do continuous improvement to the whole office, but also continuous improvement inside the tribes. The tribe have a lot 
of uh, opportunities to do uh, continuous improvement, but I want to name a few of them that are working really well. One of them is Lunch and Learn, and the other is Reading Club. They're not science fiction, they're not new, but they're working well because they uh, do it, they manage them, and it's helping them. Lunch and Learn is basically the tribe getting in front of a big screen for lunch, ordering some pizzas, and two or three of them uh, present to the others what they have learned about a certain technology or what they have learned in a conference. Or they could just take a piece of code that is crappy and they start reworking it. And the other thing is reading clubs. That's much easier. They basically select the books that they want to use to improve their crafts. And they select chapters and then have a nice chat all together in front of a beer and they discuss about this chapter. We had to change technical practices, not just uh, by uh, spreading knowledge, but also we had to hire new people with, new, uh, with those skills that we missed, especially in uh, automating testing, automating deployment, and making um, the environments more stable. And we did, we hired new people, and we started to use a whole new bunch of technologies that we didn't have one year ago. I, I'm not going into details, but all these solutions were not in place one year ago. Now we use them on a daily basis. So it's a lot of information, a lot of things that the teams had to start learning and start using, and it has been extremely, it has costed a lot of time and effort for us. But to make an example, if, you, if one year ago we used to have a regression test and deployment, it used to last three hours maybe of, of uh, manual work. Now it's automated and can be nine, 10 minutes. So it's, a, it's, it's something that pays off. It's a lot of work, but it pays off. Now, you may think that this, this is really smooth and this it gives us, gives us a lot of um, improvement. So we could be the kings of Agile or we kick ass. Well, there's a lot of things that we still need to work on. And there, there are a lot, but we, I mentioned just a few of them. So challenge number one we have now is project management integration because working, uh, the relationship between Scrum teams and project management is not really smooth yet. It's not working as we would like to. It's not lean, and sometimes we have a void who's going to do this activity. And sometimes we have duplication, the same activity done by more than one person. So it's not like we would like to. The team's velocity uh, is still unclear. Uh, we don't want to use velocity for performance, but we need that to be more predictable. And Right now, this has not happened because we have, we have had so many changes and velocity is still unclear. Backlogs, uh, until a few weeks ago, we used to have a uh, backlog per each Scrum team and we were pretty good at prioritizing backlogs locally, but then we found that visibility from this team to the other team and prioritization were not optimal for the whole company. So, what we're trying now is something slightly new for us, to have a common backlog where all the team's backlog uh, get, uh, get their items, and we focus on prioritizing this first. And finally, DevOps is still not uh, like we would like to. Uh, we did that experiment at the beginning where we wanted to improve collaboration, we brought operations inside the team, then back to be a separate team. But we still face a lot of issues when we try to collaborate, especially when we try to build a new component. This is not really, really lean at the moment. So wrapping up a little bit, this has been a year of a lot of experiments. Eventually, most of them ended up like this, to the trash bin, but a lot of them remained, and a lot of them are what we do today. It has been a lot of work, and we had to have management all the time with us. That has been key. And 
I would say if I would go um, 12 months back in time, I would probably do the same again because it's a lot of learning and it's a lot of things that we could only learn this way. And that is basically it. I hope you have some questions. Thanks. So the question is how we make sure that teams are self-organized or? Yeah, how, how do teams know? Do, do the teams know that they are self-organized? Self because in your question, you said that self-organization can fail when you engage them for the opportunity to be self-organized. Well, I wouldn't say it failed, but for a lot of them, uh, it felt completely new. So it was a bit of lack of initiative and a bit of, uh, I need my PO to approve this, otherwise I won't do anything. And what we try to do as a Kaizen team is to try and coach them that they can actually, um, they can actually make this happen. They, ha they have to take initiative to the rest of the team and, and push for it. So from one to, to 100, as you say, uh, I would say we are 60, but we can improve. Then, yeah, yeah. that I would not do again. Uh, probably the experiment with operations inside the teams. I would probably try again with a more mature setup, like now, but one year ago it was a bit, a bit um, extreme, let's say. So the Agile transformation came from, I would say both sides, but it has been key to have management all the time with us. So they, they said yes, they said let's do it, and it was a big bang for us. So we didn't start later, we just, we, we started, and we, we asked for help. We, we, we had Agile with us, and uh, they really, uh, they backed this up all the time, so it has been, success because of that as well. We couldn't have done a lot of those things without, uh, without managing buying in. So the one one thing that we can measure is, from the technical point of view, we are faster. We're not so manual, not so automated, and we not so clumsy. And we tried to automate a lot of testing, a lot of deployment. Um, so from a technical point of view, it's easy to, to say. We, we can deploy much faster now than one year ago, like minutes, and just pressing a button. Um, from the productivity point of view, it's harder to say because we went through all these changes. Velocities are still unclear. And we hope that our last setup is going to long last because we want to um, give the teams the opportunity to, to grow and gel and, and be better. So productivity is still, still a question. I want to say worse for sure, but I, it's hard to say if better, you know? Mm -hmm. 
I would say we have improved. I don't have a, uh, any data concrete, but the fact that we automated a lot of stuff is also um, helping us to make less mistakes, less of those mistakes we used to do because we had to do a lot of things manually. So uh, I would say quality is somehow has improved. Well, from a technical point of view, I don't have them he here, but there are, we could say uh, if we were deploying in hours, now it's minutes and things like this, we, we can tell those things. Um, in terms of business value, the, this also, it's, I probably didn't make it clear, this also came with a completely new product. So we started all this transformation because we had to build a completely new product. So it's also hard to compare with what we were doing before. Also, our business model is slightly different, so it's, it's hard to say. We, we, this was a kind of green field for us because we had this new product and this new um, business model, so. Testing, probably. Uh, uh, I, I would say all of them. Uh, deployment and testing are the ones that I that I would say. But if if you can automate anything, just do it. For me, deployment was a really real pain one year ago because it was a lot of manual intervention, a lot of can you please put this file here. It was really messy. And now at least we have pipelines, we have uh, tools. Um, can improve for sure, but but it's much more, much more mature. And testing, of course, we we didn't have automation tests or very little automation tests one year ago. Now we we do we try to do specification by example. We try to use Behat, and um, that has helped a lot. So we don't have to focus too much on trying things manual. We can just focus on understanding better what we need to do. Self-organized. <laughs> so the question about cultural change. And <coughs> ah, okay. I would say most people happy. Uh, managers didn't feel so well at the beginning. Some of them transitioned into tribe leaders, but others transitioned into product owners. Um, some of them didn't like this change. Some of them felt like they, it was great to be back and doing something, uh, doing something that is craft. So some of them were really happy. So. I would say apart from a couple of of people who didn't feel so well, the rest I would say they 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 were happy with the change. People involved in, in the big bang. You mean if we start as small and then spread, or we? I understood that um, you started um, from the beginning like a big bang. You know, small and then growing. Is this correct? We started uh, actually with the whole development uh, teams, so with all of them. So I would say big bang. And originally, uh, when management made the decision, I was still not uh, there, so I, I may be wrong, but I think that they, they made this decision of do it, it like Big Bang. 
Also, one thing that helped, I, I guess, is because we had the opportunity to do it. We were in a cold freeze and we were starting a new product, a new business model, so the timing was also good. So. It's about 25 uh, right now, we're supposed to grow, but, but when we started we were something less, I would say 19 and 20. Yeah, when we when we did this reshaping exercise, we said we said uh, no more than seven people. Yeah. So the question is about Kaizen team and the background of the Scrum Masters. Um, so now we are three. I have a background in QA, so I started with no idea. <laughs> and another one it was a developer who's here. And eventually uh, the most, um, the, the one with mo the, the Scrum Master we have now with, most, with more experience is also a new Scrum Master that joined us later this year. So we have a mixture and we needed someone with experience so eventually we, we made this team grew, grow. Um, but we started with who we were. My advice to make, uh, again, to make... Okay. Uh, well, I would start as soon as possible. Uh, possibly... Uh, as that experiment was a bit extreme, possibly I would try something not so not so extreme. Uh, but in the end, I think it's about um, helping them to collaborate more easily and getting them closer so that they can rely uh, on each other. And as, as soon as possible, I will start. Okay, so um, performance review and hiring is the question. Uh, performance review, we try to, we're, we're working on bringing it to the teams. So at least a part of their, um, of their goals is related with the feedback that they get from their, their peers, from their team. Then we also have the other parts of the goal are about craftsmanship and collaboration and things like this. So the, the part that that is about feedback is actually up to them. It's they do their own uh, evaluation. We still need to work on this, but it's where we are going. And then you said uh, appraisals and hiring. Hiring, um, uh, the, the hiring process is something we're working on, but the hiring process for us is, it has to be somehow uh, ended by uh, one of uh, one manager i mean in the in the tools and all this in, in the the formalism there has to be a manager who says this uh, i'm hiring but all the process uh, is about teamwork so what we what we're trying now is to have people being interviewed by the whole team who's going to receive that team member at least in the last uh, in the last part at least when we have two or three final candidates and all the previous part is basically uh, meeting 
with the tribe lead or meeting with the POs or meeting with some of the team members. So there's a lot of people involved in this. Thanks. I don't know if I answered the questions more or less. You decide. They do, they do because um, our product uh, needs a lot of um, of work in terms of uh, building new components and also resolving some tech debt. And some tech debt is a lot of users' stories or tasks that uh, deal with tech debt are actually uh, written by the team. So they end up negotiating how these enter the sprints with their product owners. So it's a mixture of both. When we started with the tribes, we were uh, we were pushing for them to do things. Some of those initiatives were actually started by scrum masters. But eventually, we are trying to delegate more and more to them. So they don't. Eventually, they will not need us to to plan if, to plan for lunch and learn or reading club. They we're trying uh, to make them uh, run these these things. And tribe lead can also help on that. Tribe lead is also. Uh, trying to drive these initiatives. So but there was another question maybe? Actually, uh, at the moment we're not thinking about new tribes, but there's nothing stopping us from doing it. So we, we try to, to keep it simple when we started, so development, QA, and operations. There's nothing stopping that from happening. What we try to do is to uh, do these projects or these improvements um, happen within the sprints, within the sprints in the Scrum teams. So they will eventually they will have their things that they want to include in sprints, and they will eventually say, "Okay, this team can handle this piece, and this team will handle this other uh, piece." So, and that's about um, their their tech depth items, for instance. But about time. We try to uh, keep that into account when we do uh, capacity uh, planning for the sprint. We, we, we keep that into account. For instance, if the tribe has a big meeting that week, we, we need to take it into account. So it will uh, reduce the capacity for that sprint. Yeah, anyone in the tribe. And tribe, and tribe lead is actually sitting with one of those teams and is actually coding with that team. Finished. Last question. Okay, so the qu the question is about clients, how they reacted about our change. Yeah, so when we started, we tried to make this as transparent as possible so that the client shouldn't really realize. But one of the next things that we want to to start change is that changing is actually how we sell uh, things to our clients. That also is something that we work on. We, did, we haven't started yet, but it's something that we want to take into account. So selling to a client and and how we we told to them also 
has to go uh, related with, with our change. It's, it's in our pipeline, it's not there yet. Thank you.